Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Travelling with your iPad and or iPhone. My name is Charlotte, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Today's session will run for approximately 45 minutes with time for questions at the end. Questions can be submitted at any time in the question box on the webinar's control panel. Our presenter today is Christine David, who is the owner and founder of IT for Retirees. IT for Retirees is aimed at people who have the time but perhaps not the know-how to use technology to their advantage and to connect to the wider world. As the owner, Christine David brings to the table over 35 years of experience in the computer industry, installing, implementing, training and supporting computer software and hardware, so she has a wealth of knowledge helping people to use their devices efficiently. A team of five trainers are handpicked for their ability to listen, understand and co communicate effectively with their clients and combined with their technical knowledge and attention to detail, every client's experience is a positive one. Christine David ha was a senior consultant at MYOB for nearly 30 years, providing best practice advice to accounting firms before changing direction to help mature aged people with technology and improving quality of life. I'll now hand you over to Christine for today's presentation. Thank you, Charlotte, and welcome, everyone. Being able to use your devices confidently and safely when traveling, both interstate and overseas, means that you are in control and able to make informed decisions at all times. For the next 45 minutes, I'll be running through some handy hints and tips to ensure your trip is stress-free whilst using your devices. The great thing about Apple's software and their devices is that what you learn to do on one is exactly the same on the other. So much of what we'll be showing you today can be done on any Apple device. A question I often get asked is, what is the difference between Wi-Fi and mobile data? So I think the best way to explain that is to actually show you on an example telephone bill. Now, this is a Telstra bill, and it's divided into two sections. So the top section in blue has a 200 gigabyte Wi-Fi allowance to be able to be used in my home. To be able to access that, the internet, I have to access it via a modem. So Wi-Fi is the ability to connect to the internet via a modem, whether it's your modem or someone else's modem, like a modem in a hotel or at the airport, um, shopping centres, libraries, in your work environment. So Wi-Fi sends an electronic signal to the modem to enable you to connect to the internet. Mobile data, however, needs a SIM card in the device to be able to connect to the internet. So what that SIM card in fact does is turns your device, turns your phone or your iPad into its own portable little modem. But to do that, the device must have a SIM card. Now, the second part of my Telstra bill, this white section, is basically what I'm paying for my mobile data and my mobile phone plan. Now, you can see with the mobile phone plan, I'm only getting one gigabyte of data per month. And I'm paying 60 odd dollars for the privilege. That also does include some telephone calls and text messages, so it's not just um, for my mobile data. But compared to what I'm getting for my Wi-Fi data at home, which is 200 gigabytes, and I'm only paying $115, and that includes local calls, STD calls, etc. So the difference between your Wi-Fi and your mobile data is that Wi-Fi enables you to connect to the internet via a modem or a router of some sort, as opposed to mobile data, which needs a SIM card, and it must have its own data plan. I find a lot of my clients aren't really sure what they have, nor how much they're paying, 
nor how much data they're entitled to use. It's really important that you do know these boundaries or these constraints, these amounts that you are paying for, so that you don't inadvertently exceed those monthly allowances. Down the bottom of this presentation, there's a little screen image here, which is what I'll show you in a moment on my mobile phone. So on our Apple devices, whether it's an iPhone or an iPad, in the top left-hand corner, you'll see this, these symbols. Basically what's on the left-hand side, these dots and the word Telstra, this refers to my mobile data. So basically what is I can use via my SIM card. This one gigabyte of data on my phone is highlighted by these five dots and the word Telstra because Telstra is the telco for whom I pay to use the internet. The number of dots on the left hand side simply indicates my signal strength. So the more dots, the better. So at the moment with this image, I've got five dots, so I've got a very strong signal. As I get further and further from the tower, um, the, the Telstra tower that pings the signals off, these dots will get less and less. So it'll go to four, three, two, one, etc. And when it can't um, reach that tower, there'll be no no dots, there's no signal strength, um, which means that I won't be able to make and receive phone calls, I won't be able to use the internet at all. On the right hand side of the word Telstra is my Wi-Fi symbol, which is sort of like the V with these horizontal lines across them. Wherever possible, please connect to Wi-Fi over and above your uh, mobile data. The reason for that is twofold. Uh, firstly, it is a lot cheaper. So as we've seen with our telephone bill, our telco bill, uh, 200 gigabytes costing me $115 versus one gigabyte or one two hundredth of what I'm getting on my Wi-Fi modem is costing me $60. So it's cheaper to use Wi-Fi. The other benefit is that some of the things that you need to do on your Apple device, Apple have actually made the decision that you cannot do it using your mobile data. So for example, downloading software. It's something that you need to do quite regularly on your devices. And Apple have, I think they've had a lot of flack in the past with people complaining that they've accidentally exceeded their mobile data plan when they've downloaded the software. So what Apple have done is barred downloading software via your mobile data or your SIM card. So unless you're connected to Wi-Fi, you cannot download software onto your device and you can't back up it to the cloud. So Wi-Fi is a very good thing and you should use it wherever possible. A lot of people ask me, well, how much data do I need and, and what uses data on my devices? So most of the things that you're going to do on your iPad in particular will need data. So for example, your emails, searching for information on the internet, uh, using GPS functionality for like Google Maps or the Apple Maps, um, FaceTime and Facebook and Skype and Viber and WhatsApp and finding the weather and online banking and shopping and world clocks and Uber and oh, there's so many things that you can do on these devices, but they all need data. They all need to access the internet for those features, for those apps to work. So most of what you're going to be doing on your devices, whether it's an iPhone or an iPad, do, does require data. Another trap that a lot of my clients fall into 
is that they have a phone, whether it's an iPhone or it's a Samsung or HTC or whatever brand it happens to be, they have these smartphones, which they use in Australia. They have a, a, a plan in Australia. They have an amount of data that they pay for in Australia. And everything's great. Everything works. Life's good. They then take that device overseas and they start using Google Maps and they download their emails and they upload photos onto Facebook and they do all the things that they were able to do back in Australia. And everything's working, life's good, until they get home and they receive their first bill from Telstra or Optus or TPG or whoever their telco is. And all the data, every time they've used an app, they've downloaded something while overseas on their mobile data, because these plans are only available and only applicable in Australia, those, that data that they have used overseas is actually going to be an additional charge, which will be itemised on their monthly bill, and it will be charged at international data roaming rates which are hellishly expensive. So the, those horror stories where you hear of people coming home and getting a bill for $1,000 or 700 and something dollars because they have used some of these features overseas that require data and they didn't know that they should connect to Wi-Fi and they simply use the mobile data on their device. To give you an idea of some um, costs so you can quantify this this problem um, if you were overseas and you were using your mobile data uh, just to open one website could cost you three or four dollars now if you're searching for something on the internet you often open multiple pages so every time you click on a link or you open another site it will be costing you three or four dollars every time you clicked on one of those pages. To upload a photo onto Facebook, which we all do regularly when we travel. If I was to do that using my mobile data overseas and I didn't have a special international data roaming pack, then that could cost me four or five dollars per photo, depending on the size of that photo. So you can see how quickly these amounts add up and they will be charged separately on your phone bill. So that would be your welcome home present um, from Telstra or from Optus or whoever uh, you get your telephone plan through. So it's just being armed with this information and knowing how to swap between mobile data and Wi-Fi so that you're in control at all times. I always say to my clients, it's always best before you actually leave Australia, when you're at the airport in the lounge or sitting in a cafe, having a coffee or a drink before you get onto that plane, turn your mobile data off. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment. and how to actually turn your mobile data off. And as I said before, I always recommend to people to turn their mobile data off before they leave Australia. 
because I know what it's like. You get on that, you travel to your destination and you're either jet lagged or you're tired or hungry and or there's a lot. Don't remember to uh, turn that mobile data off when you get to your destination. So always do it before you leave Australia. So I'm just going to go into settings. There's an option here called mobile data. Anywhere where we have a little arrow at the end of that line that points right, that indicates there's another menu or different options underneath that mobile um, menu option. So we simply tap on mobile to go to the next menu. We've got an option here called mobile data. At the moment that's turned on. I'm in Australia and I want to be able to use my mobile data when I'm out and about. When I'm not physically connected to a modem, I still want to be able to use Google Maps. I might want to use Uber. I might want to get bus timetables, the, the weather, the time. All of those things need the internet. They need data to function. I mentioned before in the top left hand corner of my phone, it gives you an indication of my mobile data and the signal strength, as well as being connected to Wi-Fi. So in that top left-hand corner, you can see that I have three black dots out of the five. So I've got a reasonable signal strength, but it's not five dots. It's not rock solid, not a very, not a real strong signal. I still can make and receive phone calls, I still can use data, but it's not the strongest signal um, at this point. On the right hand side after the word Telstra is my Wi-Fi symbol. With your portable devices, with these smart devices, your phone, your tablet, etc., if it has a SIM card, which every mobile phone will have, then I would strongly recommend that you also attach or connect to Wi-Fi on that device. So at the moment, I've got both options selected on my phone. I'm connected to Wi-Fi and I have a SIM card, so I have mobile data access as well. Now, these devices are smart. So how they work is that if I'm connected to Wi-Fi, then my device will use Wi-Fi data. As soon as I am too far away from that modem to connect to Wi-Fi, and that's roughly 25 to 30 metres, and you'll see that the signal strength, these horizontal bars, will reduce and get less and less the further I, away I get from that modem. Once it's too far and out of range, Wi-Fi will drop out completely, and the only way this device can connect to the internet is via my SIM card using my mobile data. So basically, the, the, the way in which your device works, it gives you seamless access to the internet. So when you're within range of Wi-Fi, it will connect automatically and use your Wi-Fi data, which is cheap. And when you're out of range, it will automatically revert to your mobile data. So you can use these devi devices wherever you are. Uh, you don't need to physically um, be connected to a modem. So to turn the mobile data off, you simply tap on this green button so it goes white. I find that a lot of clients aren't sure or about what they are using on their devices that's taking up all the data. So this screen with your mobile data on your phone also shows me how much data I have used on this device and which apps have required data. So you can see on this screen that my mobile data usage is 3.3 gigabytes. Now, before you fall off your chair, that what that's not just in a day or a, a month. This has been um, a couple of months usage. So it basically accumulates. 
So a, a handy tip that if you are out and about, whether it's here in Australia or overseas, and you really do need to use your mobile data for a particular task, what you can do is you can reset your mobile data usage back to zero. You can use whatever app you needed to use when you're out and about that was needing your mobile data. And that will then show you at the end of that task how much data you actually used while performing that action. If we scroll through this screen, you'll see that all the apps that I have um, flagged to use mobile data are listed on this screen. And you can turn these on or off. So for example, this is where I can tell my phone which apps I allow or um, authorise my device to use my mobile data. So for example, some of my um, word games, I'm really not going to be playing those when I'm out and about, so I've turned that off. Um, things like the app store or the weather, or my, my favourite little app called Bean Hunter. If anyone's a coffee nut like I am, and uh, they want to know where the closest coffee shop is to where you're currently standing, then Bean Hunter is a, a nice little app that does exactly that. It doesn't do anything else, but it locates a good coffee shop uh, closest to where I'm currently standing, anywhere around Australia. So I can either turn these apps on or off. So all it means is that if I'm out and about and I'm not connected to Wi-Fi, then only the apps that I have turned on in this section will be able to work because they will actually use the data off my SIM card, so my mobile data. If we go right to the bottom of this screen, now my, I've got quite a few apps on my phone, so this is quite a lengthy list, but right down the bottom is where we can actually reset uh, our usage statistics. Um, so you can start at zero and find out how much data a particular app needs. So a few screens uh, scrolling down, you can see that there's an option right at the bottom called Reset Statistics. And I last reset my stats on the 22nd of April. So it's been uh, you know, a few months that I've used 3.3 gigabytes. Connecting to public Wi-Fi. This is something that I would strongly encourage everybody that has one of these portable smart devices, whether it's a smartphone or it's a tablet, to know how to connect to Wi-Fi and also be able to identify safe Wi-Fi versus ones that I personally would not connect to. You just have to remember with public Wi-Fi that because it's open to the general public, there are no controls over who actually connects to that Wi-Fi and what they use the internet for whilst on the Wi-Fi. So I just want to show you how to connect to public Wi-Fi and a, a nice little um, way to pick up whether this is a safe um, network or one that I would probably avoid. We've already spoken about how Wi-Fi is much cheaper than your mobile data via your SIM card, but public Wi-Fi basically is free. And you will see public Wi-Fi in a number of different places. So for example, most shopping centres have public Wi-Fi, libraries have public Wi-Fi, um, McDonald's and Starbucks, most ho um, hotels have Wi-Fi, um, airports, etc. So most places that you go to um, these days have Wi-Fi access of some sort. It's just a matter of working out what are the safer public Wi-Fi options and what to do while you're connected and how long to stay connected.
So what I'll do now is I'll take you on to, um, again, a demonstration on my phone and show you how to search for Wi-Fi and how to connect. So from a, there's an option here called Wi-Fi. Now, I am actually connected to Wi-Fi at the moment, hence the Wi-Fi symbol in the top left-hand corner of the screen. If you don't have a, a Wi-Fi connection, you might have this saying off, in which case you must turn your Wi-Fi option on so it can then scan and find any Wi-Fi networks within a 25 to 30 metre radius. notice periodically the little processing symbol will come up probably every 30 to 45 seconds. This is something that your device does automatically whenever you have the Wi-Fi option turned on. So having this option turned on tells your device scan periodically and provide a list of all the Wi-Fi networks within 25 to 30 metres of where I'm currently standing. Now, this is my modem in the office that I'm currently connected to. You'll notice that there is a little padlock symbol. That means that you can only connect to this Wi-Fi network if you know the password. Some public Wi-Fi doesn't require a password, in which case there will be no padlock symbol at all. I would just like to point out um, the fact that if there's no password, then any Tom, Dick and Harry basically can connect to that Wi-Fi network. Personally, I avoid public Wi-Fi that have no password like the plague. If that is the only Wi-Fi network that is available to me and I really need to check something, then I would connect check what I have to check, and then log off straight away. I would spend the least amount of time possible on that public Wi-Fi where there is no password protection. Where there is a password, and you'll find that often in hotels, uh, when you go to check in, um, you give them all your details, et cetera, ask them um, for their Wi-Fi password, and then you can connect to the hotel's Wi-Fi. Yes, there are other people that are connected to that Wi-Fi, but it is limited to, to um, people that have actually booked into that hotel. I find some clients, when they go to connect to Wi-Fi, that they tap on the little I symbol. What that does is it tells you a lot of um, technical information about that Wi-Fi, the IP address and, and things like that, which are of no um, meaning and you don't need to access that information. So if you do tap on the little I, just simply use the back arrow to go back to this screen. You simply tap on the network itself, the network name, you just tap somewhere on the word and if there is a password required it will come up and ask you to enter that password. It will then verify that password and if it's correct you'll get the little tick alongside the Wi-Fi network name and the Wi-Fi symbol will appear in the top left hand corner of your screen. If you put the wrong password in it is not going to let you connect. There is also another option here where you have multiple devices. If you have a, um, a mobile phone that has a SIM card and you have a tablet that is Wi-Fi only, what you can do is you can actually tether your iPad 
to your iPhone. Now, all that means, and I'll show you how to do that shortly, but all that means is that you are connecting your iPad to your phone as if the phone was a little Wi-Fi modem. Now, if you're going to be doing any sort of financial transaction on the internet, I would never connect to public Wi-Fi and pay all my bills. I would never connect to public Wi-Fi and put my credit card details in. You are asking for trouble. If you must do those tasks, any sort of financial transaction, then keep it as safe as possible by connecting to your personal hotspot or using your phone's mobile data. You'll be very, very thankful um, because you won't get um, compromised uh, in any way. So we spoke about tethering your iPhone. And as I mentioned before, it simply enables another device to connect to your SIM card on your phone and treat your phone like your own personal portable Wi-Fi modem. It does use your mobile data off your phone. So if you are overseas, it is going to cost you extra unless you have purchased an international data roaming pack. But as I said before, it, it will be worth every cent to stay on a secure network when you're conducting financial transactions rather than connecting to free Wi-Fi that ha could have anybody on that network um, that could potentially um, read information off your device, that, um, identity theft, they can get credit card details. Um, the tools that some of these hackers have are, are quite in, um, incredible. So if you do need to conduct financial transactions, please do not do it on public Wi-Fi. So to tether your phone, to basically enable your iPad to connect to your mobile phone, so it uses the, the, the mobile data, it creates that, that um, private secure little network that only uh, you can access. It's, a two-pronged approach. So you first of all, you have to um, turn on your phone, you have to turn the personal hotspot on. So that's the first part, so that your phone turns into like a little portable modem. And then the second part is that you then connect to your phone um, in that list of Wi-Fi options on your iPad. So if I go into a personal hotspot, I'm not actually going to drop me off the Wi-Fi and you'll cease to see my presentation anymore. But if I was to turn my personal hotspot on my phone, this little button, I would tap it and it would go green. Now, this is the important piece. This is your uniquely generated password that you need to enter onto your iPad to enable your iPad to connect to your phone and use the phone like a portable modem. So unless another member of the public 
has this particular password, they have got no hope of connecting um, to your personal hotspot. And that's why it's such a horrendous looking password. It just makes it very, very difficult to break. Apple are very good and they try wherever possible to give you as much um, background information, step-by-step -step instructions, so that you can do this process on your own. So once you've turned your personal hotspot on your phone, on our um, iPad, you would simply go into this Wi-Fi option. And if I turned on, this device is going to be searching for any portable Wi-Fi within a 25 to 30 metre radius. And there is our personal hotspot. If I tapped on that, it would ask me for a password. And that's where I put that very long um, jumble of letters and numbers that I saw on my phone. I put that password into my iPad so that my iPad is able to tether or connect to my iPhone and use my mobile data in a very secure, private little hotspot. So as I said before, look, if I need to connect to public Wi-Fi to perhaps check a booking or look for some accommodation when I'm out and about overseas, then yes, I do it. But I would not pay for um, my accommodation. I wouldn't um, do any online banking, anything that of a financial nature. I would not do that on public Wi-Fi. You're really asking for trouble. One thing that a lot of clients um, forget to do, and it's really, really important, once you've turned your hotspot on and you've conducted whatever you needed to do on your device, please remember to turn it off. So to do that, you simply go back to your iPhone, you go into your personal hotspot and turn it off. So that severs the connection between your phone and your iPad and it stops the iPad using the mobile data off your phone plan. The iCloud. So basically, I, I have a lot of um, people that get very um, anxious about the cloud. They're not sure about it. They think it's Big Brother doing its thing and they want to steer clear of it. But iCloud is a very, very good tool um, because it enables you to securely store your photos, your videos, contacts, appointments, documents, music, apps, electronic books, etc. It enables them to be secured and securely stored in the cloud as a, a backup, but also it enables all of your devices that are logged in with the same Apple ID to see the same information. So basically up here in the cloud is your source of truth. All your data is stored up here and basically your phone and your tablet and your MacBook or your iMac computer are simply devices that are accessing or viewing that information stored in the cloud. So it's great to be able to be out and about and taking a photo on your phone, and then you come back home and you can see that photo on your iPad and your MacBook. Uh, you might be making a, a telephone call and you realise that their address is incorrect, so you can change their address in your contacts. It changes it on your tablet. It changes it on your computer. Everything is in sync with each other. And as I said before, the other benefit of using the cloud is that if you lose your device, so say you're out and about with your phone. You've got your, your mobile phone and you've taken thousands of photos on it. Last day of your trip, you lose it. Or you drop it and it smashes into a thousand pieces. If you don't have a backup, if you haven't got those photos stored in the cloud or you haven't synchronised with iTunes, that means that every one of those photos is gone. 
because it's stored on the device itself and it's not stored in the cloud. So the iCloud is something that Apple provide free of charge to every person that has an Apple device. So when you buy an Apple device, whether it's an iPhone, an iPad, MacBook, iMac, you must create an Apple ID. So every Apple ID that is known to Apple, they give those Apple IDs five gigabytes of storage for free in the cloud. Now, if you find that five gigabytes is not enough and you run out, then you've got two choices. You either start cleaning up. So you're looking at all your photos. Do I really need 10 photos of that mountain? Well, probably not. So start culling photos and reducing the amount of data on your device. So it does fit in that five gigabytes of storage. But if you do need all those photos and you can't clear off any more, then what you can do is upgrade your cloud subscription. So as I said, the first five gigabytes are free. And after that, you can actually pay for additional storage. So just to give you an idea, for the, the huge amount of $1.49 a month, um, you can then be upgraded to 50 gigabytes of storage in the cloud. So, you know, for the sake of 15, you know, $16 a year, you know that all your photos, all your contacts, your music, your movies, your electronic books, all that sort of information is all securely backed up in the cloud. Actually, some people actually ask me, Del, where is the cloud? Surely it's not actually floating around in the sky. And no, it's not floating around in the sky. Um, Apple have got um, huge storage facilities actually in North Carolina in the US. So they have these huge data warehouses full of computers um, and they allocate five gigabytes of storage, uh, secure storage to every Apple user. So what I'd like to do is to show you where you can turn the iCloud feature on and some of the options that you can set in iCloud. So we're still in settings on our phone. Now, if you've upgraded your operating system um, in the last probably Oh, six, four to six months uh, when iOS 10 uh, came out, you'll notice that you get this profile area at the top of settings. So they've moved anything to do with your Apple ID, iCloud, iTunes and the App Store into your profile at the top of settings. If you haven't updated to the latest version of the Apple operating system, so iOS 10.3.3 is the most up to date, then there would actually be a separate iCloud option further down the settings window. So we're going to go into the profile area because we want to access iCloud. There's a, a number of menu options. You'll see there's one there called iCloud. So that's the one we're going to go into now. Now, iCloud will only work when you are connected to Wi-Fi. So if you wanted to do a backup, if you want to synchronise all your devices, if you want some of these changes to go from one device to the other, then you must be connected to Wi-Fi. So the scenario might occur that you're out and about with your camera, if not your camera, your iPhone, and you take a photo. Now you won't see that photo on your iPad or your MacBook until you bring your phone to uh, a, 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 an area that you can connect to Wi-Fi. And once you're connected to Wi-Fi, that photo that you had taken on your phone uploads into the cloud, which means it is visible from your other devices. Now this area at the top of iCloud is, is very interesting. So this is the storage that I have available to me in the cloud. I've actually upgraded my subscription to 50 gigabytes um, of data. So I pay my $1.49 every month 
and it is worth every cent. You'll see that there's some colour um, combinations here. We can see the blue section is your photos. So most of the space that I'm using, most of the 10 gigabytes of data that I'm using in the cloud is taken up by photos. I think I've got about a thousand or 1200 odd photos and, and videos that I have, um, have taken on either my phone or my iPad. The next little percentage there is how much space is being taken up of a backup of my device. And that backup feature is really handy when you want to upgrade your device. So say you've got um, an older iPhone and your two year um, plan might be due for renewal. You can purchase, um, if you want to, a, a new phone and you can back up everything that's on your old phone and restore it on your new phone. Well, it takes all of about 10 minutes and it's as if your new phone has knows how your other phone was set up and you just off, off you go. It's just so easy to upgrade from an old phone to a new phone. The green section is for documents and I've got a small number of, of documents that I've got stored in um, um, iCloud Drive and if I had any iCloud emails, now this is not my standard email system. So I have actually got a Big Pond email and I've also got uh, a business email. This email that it's talking about here, this orange bit, is if you have an iCloud email. That's why this little option I have got turned off. I don't have an iCloud email address. When I started using Apple devices quite a few years ago, I already had my email addresses set up, so I didn't need an iCloud email address. But if you're starting fresh and you've never had an Apple device before, then you can actually have your device create a, an iCloud email address for you and then your emails will be stored in iCloud. My uh, Telstra or my Big Pond emails, my business emails are all stored on separate servers owned by the telcos that host my email system. So Telstra uh, look after my Big Pond and I have a, um, a hosting um, business that uh, looks after my business email addresses. So all my emails are stored in the cloud, but not the Apple cloud. They're stored on different clouds. I think it's getting quite busy up there. You can see all the other options I have turned on. So I'm storing my contacts, calendars, reminders, notes, Safari, etc., all into the cloud. So if I add an appointment on my phone, I will see it on my tablet and I'll see it on my MacBook. So everything is in sync. I have one source of truth. You can see there's quite a few options and you can elect to turn these on or off depending on whether you want to have them accessible um, across multiple devices. So with turning on iCloud, it's a matter of simply going into the iCloud option and turning each of these features either on or off. You'll notice with your photos, there's actually a little arrow on the right hand side, which means there's another menu of choices underneath. So if we just have a quick look at what we can do, because I'll turn iCloud on, but they forget to then drill down into photos and to turn iCloud Photo Library on. This is what you need to have turned on if you want your photos to be visible across all of your devices. And you can see that mine was last updated at 21 minutes past 10 this morning. So every time these devices connect to Wi-Fi, if there's any new photos that have been taken on that particular device, they automatically get uploaded to the cloud and I know they're safe. So there's quite a few other options under photos. So if you do want your photos to be visible across all devices, make sure you go into the photos option and turn on iCloud Photo Library.
The other option when we're in iCloud, just at the bottom of this window, is the feature iCloud Backup. Please, if this is the only thing that you take away from today's session, please make sure that you've got iCloud Backup turned on so that you have a secure backup of your data in the cloud in case something happens to your device, whether you lose it, it gets stolen. You Actually, I had one of my clients rang me last week and they were actually cleaning their toilet and they had their phone in their pocket. They leant over and you guessed it, the phone went straight into the toilet. Uh, they took it into Apple, they couldn't fix it, they couldn't resurrect it, it was as dead as a doornail. Luckily, she'd been to one of my classes, she'd turned on iCloud Backup, she bought another phone, restored from backup, she didn't lose a thing. So other than a bit of an inconvenience, she had all the contacts, her photos, her appointments, everything that she had before was on her new phone. So in this option here, iCloud Backup, Again, we've got a little arrow pointing right, which means there's another menu underneath. We can tap on iCloud Backup and make sure that it's turned on. This means that every time I have three criteria met, this device will be backed up automatically to the cloud. So for example, this device was last backed up at 8 a.m. this morning. So whenever I have my device connected to Wi-Fi, so I've got my Wi-Fi symbol. I have this option turned on and I'm connected to Wi-Fi and it has to be um, plugged into power. So once I have all those options um, ticked, I've plugged in, the uh, device is turned off and I'm connected to Wi-Fi, then it will back up automatically. I don't need to remember to back up my device. And to me, that is the only sort of backup to, to have set, is one that you don't have to remember to do. Just like to quickly show you uh, an area that enables you to see how much data uh, your, uh, how much space you've used on your device itself as well as in the cloud and how to see which apps are taking up the most amount of space. So this little screen which I'll show you in a moment is divided into two sections. So we have the storage at the top which is how much space is taken up on the device itself. This section here is how much data is used in your amount allocated to you in the cloud. So storage here is the device, this is in the cloud. So I'll just take you um, into those routines now um, so you can see how to find um, how much space you've used, how much is free and what's taking up all that room. So we're back to going to go into general. So we just need to scroll down and find the general option. And we tap on that. You'll see an option called storage and iCloud usage. Again, anything that's got an arrow pointing right, we've got a menu underneath. So this is an example of what we saw earlier. The top section is about the storage on the actual device. So on my phone, I've used 19 gigabytes of storage and I have still nearly 105 gigabytes left. So I've got bucket loads of space. If I wanted to see how much uh, each app was taking on my device, then I have an option here called manage storage. Again, there's a little arrow, we can drill down. Now it will go through and sort all our apps in order of largest to smallest. So I can see that 1.48 gigabytes is taken up with my photos, video and camera, then GarageBand, and then we're getting to the smaller apps that are now in the megabytes. So there are a thousand megabytes 
to each gigabyte. So this is taking up the most amount of space and it then goes down to the smaller amounts. And the apps that you see depended upon what you've actually downloaded on your particular device. You probably get those apps, so I've got lots on there. You can actually delete an app from this screen. Rather than holding your finger on the app until it jiggles and hitting the little X, you can actually delete multiple apps through this area. So for example, if I wanted to get rid of this one here called Clips, it's only taking 52 megabytes, it's tiny, but again, I've got a little arrow pointing right. I can tap on it, and you'll see that I can actually delete the app from this window. To clean up, it might be quicker to delete multiple apps through this screen. Okay, Homeward Trail, we've got four minutes to cover Find My iPhone. So this is a really handy feature to be able to locate a lost device. Uh, you can see from this screenshot here that we've got multiple devices um, where I am currently based. Um, it's my husband, my son and myself. We've got all these iPads and, and iPhones. This is the little app symbol called Find My iPhone. Now you download that from the App Store. It doesn't come automatically on your device. And it's the same app whether or not you're downloading it to an iPhone or an iPad. Now there's two parts to this routine. You must turn the feature on, first of all, on your particular device. So if I've got an iPhone, I have to turn um, Find My iPhone on. And then I have to download the app and log in with my Apple ID. So I'll just quickly show you where to find, uh, find my iPhone um, and then what the app itself looks like. Now, if you do turn this feature on and you ever want to get rid of your phone, so you may have upgraded your phone, you may want to hand it down to a family member, first thing you must do before you reset that phone is to turn off Find My iPhone. You'll get into all sorts of bother if you don't. Okay, so let's quickly find out go into the iCloud profile, just like we went to before. So into our profile up here and into iCloud. Let's drill down into iCloud. And right now there's an option there called Find My iPhone. And there's the little icon, so that's the app that we have to download, but we must turn that feature on. Once you've turned the feature on, we can then download the app, and I'll show you what the app itself looks like. that I've got all my different devices. 
And if I wanted to find, I know it does sound like Big Brother, if I wanted to see where my husband was, I can simply tap on it and we can see that my husband is at uh, Sydney Olympic Park at work. You do have an option called actions down the bottom. So what you can do is that you can send um, a, a noise, you can actually uh, play a sound. It looks like my husband's actually in the, the line building. Um, I can send um, a, a, a sound so I can locate that device if I'd misplaced it. Uh, but most importantly, I can actually erase the content of that device remotely, which is wonderful if you've lost your device. So thank you everyone for your time. We've just quickly to recap, we've gone through the difference between Wi-Fi and mobile data. We've connected to public Wi-Fi safely. We've tethered our phone to our iPad to enable us to conduct financial transactions in a secure environment. We've looked at iCloud and how to back up. We've also examined the data usage and to identify where all the, the space of my device has been taken. And we've had a bit of a play with um, Find My iPhone. So thank you so much and back to you, Charlotte. Thanks, Christine. Um, there haven't been any questions submitted, so I think we might just end the session there. Thanks so much for today's presentation and thank you everyone for participating today. Uh, we, we hope you've enjoyed the webinar series with Christine and we hope there will be another one coming up soon. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, bye.